Hello everyone, this is Jörg Lissmann once again from YouTube channel Jörgler66 and today I will start something else, something new on my channel. I'm gonna read a new book that is called Mystery Babylon Religion. It comes by the author of Ralph Woodrow. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. When you follow the reading, you surely will afterwards. Um, this book has uh, 20 chapters and uh, 156 pages, so I think it will take me quite a while to go through that. Especially because here and there is a little bit comment probably in place to do. But that's the thing I love, you know. Now, my motivation for reading this book is, first of all, the name, Mystery Babylon Religion. And Mystery Babylon is, of course, as you all know, something that is already mentioned in the Bible. And as I stated in the beginning when I started reading Rulers of Evil, as Bill Clinton said, the worst thing that you can do in life is to underestimate your adversary, your enemy. For me, as a Bible-believing Christian, someone who follows the King James Bible only, as my, let's say, authority that I have when I say something, it is very important also to know the adversary. And we all know that the Roman Catholic Church actually is Babylon and just a continuation of Babylon and has its roots in Babylon. And therefore I think it's very interesting to do a reading on Mystery Babylon Religion because we have to know <coughs> our enemy to understand him. And probably we'll see this in this book, otherwise you know that anyway, that when the Tower of Babel was destroyed and the nations were formed by our Lord when he scattered the people in different tongues all over the world, we know that the Freemasons who claim to have their origin in Babel, discovered another kind of language, the language of symbolism. And the world today is filled with symbols. We see them every day, but very often we cannot even recognize them, because we are not taught what they are. And in this book, Mystery Babylon Religion, we will go through a lot of these symbols and what they actually mean and how, for example, it came to pass that Christianity, or, or let, let me say it that way, that the uh, Roman pagan empire actually got quote-unquote baptized by Christianity. And of course, therefore, it is very important to know all the symbols to distinguish a real Christianity from paganism. And I think this book will help us. And this book starts in the first chapter that is called Babylon Sun Worship. It's the source of all false religion. That does mean that it is not only the source of the Roman Catholic Church, but it is also <clears throat> the source of Hinduism, of Buddhism, Shamanism. It's the source of Islam, of course, because Islam was founded by the Vatican, as you probably all know already. And all in all these religions and in all these um, nations are symbols used, and these symbols mean something for the people in the hierarchy, and they can also mean something for the lay people, as le at least if they know them. So that's a little bit my motivation to read this book to you, and uh, I hope you will enjoy it as much as I do, and I tell you I have not read the book in advance, only chapter 1 and chapter 2. So now I'm going to read chapter 1, Babylon Sun Worship, Source of All False Religion, from the book Mystery Babylon Religion. The mystery religion of Babylon has been symbolically described in the last book of the Bible as a woman, quote, arrayed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, 
having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And when we turn to the King James Bible, we read the reference here in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Quote, and there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So she carried me away, uh, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication." Unquote. So we see already here, in Revelation chapter 17, what this beast is, what this um, what this woman is, where she comes from. Because we know that, as it is written in Revelation 17, the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And waters are in Bible prophecy, in another place in the Bible, explained as being tongues, multitudes and nations, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, we are talking, of course, about spiritual fornication. And the kings of the earth have done that and are still doing that. And you can see that by every quote-unquote king, whether it's a king or it is a president or it is a prime minister, going to Rome and kissing the Pope's ring. There we see revelation fulfilled. So when the Bible uses symbolic language, a woman can symbolize a church. The true church, for example, is likened to a bride, a chaste virgin, a woman without spot or blemish. And we go here to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27 to understand that a little bit better. Quote, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish." Unquote. And also in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 8, we read, quote, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she would be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Unquote. This, of course, is in total contradiction to what we first read in Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6, where that woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet, which is the opposite of clean and white, and the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So the first woman does not have the same cloth or the self-righteousness as this woman. But here, in striking contrast, an unclean woman, a defiled woman, a harlot, is pictured, as I just tried to make clear to you. If it is here correct to apply this symbolism to a church system, it is clear that only a defiled and fallen church could be meant. In big capital letters, the Bible calls her Mystery Babylon. When John wrote the book of Revelation, Babylon, as a city and empire, had already been destroyed and left in ruins, as the Old Testament prophets had foretold, as we can read in Isaiah 13, verses 19 through 22, and in Jeremiah 51, verse 52. I'm going to read these two quotes for you, that you will understand that perfectly. Isaiah 13, verse 19 through 22. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. 
It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. The owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the islands shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. And in chapter 51, verse 52 of Jeremiah we read, quote, Wherefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will do judgment upon her graven images, and through all her land the wound shall groan. But the, end quote, but the religious concepts and customs that originated in Babylon continued on and were well represented in many nations of the world. Just what was the religion of ancient Babylon? How did it all begin? What significance does it hold in modern times? How does it all tie in with what John wrote in the book of Revelation? Turning the pages of time back to the period shortly after the flood, men begin to migrate from the east, quote, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there, as we can read in Genesis 11, uh, verse 2. It was here that the city of Babylon was built and this land came, became known as Babylonia or later as Mesopotamia. Here the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers had built up rich deposits of earth that could produce crops in abundance. But there were certain problems the people faced. For one thing, the land was overrun with wild animals which were a constant threat to the safety and peace of the inhabitants. And we can read in Exodus chapter 23 verses 29 and 30 for confirmation in the Bible. Quote, I will not drive them out from there, <coughs> uh, sorry, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field multiply against thee. By little and little I will drive them out before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. Unquote. Obviously anyone who could successfully provide protection from these wild beasts would receive great acclaim from the people. It was at this point that at, uh, that at a large, powerful, powerfully built man by the name of Nim... Oh, sorry, gonna read that sentence again, I screwed that up. <laughs> It was at this point that a large, powerfully built man by the name of Nimrod appeared on the scene. He became famous as a mighty hunter against the wild animals. The Bible tells us, And Kash begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Unquote. And this comes from Genesis chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Apparently, Nimrod's success as a mighty hunter caused him to become famous among those primitive people. He became, quote-unquote, a mighty one. In the earth, a famous leader in worldly affairs. Gaining this prestige, he devised a better means of protection. Instead of constantly fighting the wild beasts, why not organize the people into cities to surround them with walls of protection? Then, why not organize these cities into a kingdom? Evidently, this was the thinking of Nimrod, for the Bible tells us that he organized such a kingdom. And now comes a quote from Genesis chapter 10, verse 10, quote, And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erak, and Akkad, and Kalni, in the land of Shinar. Unquote. The kingdom of Nimrod is the first mentioned in the Bible. And little quote from me here. We know that he was the founder of Babel, Babylon. And when you later go into the Bible, of course, in the book of Daniel, where Daniel tells you that the world consists of four consecutive kingdoms, Babylon was the first one. The golden head of the figure and the lion, the winged 
a winged lion, of course. But continue reading. Whatever advances may have been made by Nimrod would have been well and good, but Nimrod was an ungodly ruler. The name Nimrod came from, comes from Marat, meaning he rebelled. The expression that he was a mighty one, quote-unquote, before the Lord, can carry a hostile meaning, the word before being sometimes used as meaning against the Lord. The Jewish, Encyclo Jewish Encyclopedia says that Nimrod was, quote, he who made all the people rebellious against God, unquote. The noted historian Josephus wrote, quote, Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He also gradually changed the government into tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God. The multitudes were very ready to follow the determination of Nimrod, and they built a tower, neither sparing any pains, nor being in any degree negligent about the work, and, by reason of the multitude of hands employed in it, it grew very high. The place wherein they built the tower is now called Babylon." Unquote. Basing these conclusions on information that has come down to us in history, legend and mythology, Alexander Hislop has written in detail of how Babylonian religion developed around traditions concerning Nimrod, his wife Semiramis, and her child Tammuz. When Nimrod died, according to the old stories, his body was cut into pieces, burned, and sent to various areas. Now, similar practices are mentioned in the Bible, and for reference, I turn you to the book of Judges, chapter 29, verse 29, and to 1 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 7. Judges, chapter 19, quote, And when he was come into his house, he took a knife, and laid hold on his concubine, and divided her, together with her bones, into twelve pieces, and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. Unquote. And in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 7, we read, quote, And he took a yoke of oxen, and hooed them in pieces, and sent them throughout all the coast of Israel by the hands of messengers, saying, Whosoever cometh no forth, not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto this oxen, unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Unquote. Following his death, Nimrod's death, which was greatly mourned by the people of Babylon, his wife Semiramis claimed he was now the sun god. Later, when she gave birth to a son, she claimed that her son Tammuz, by name, was their hero, Nimrod, reborn. That actually makes her the mother and the wife in the same time. There you see already how twisted pagan religion is. The mother of Tammuz had probably heard the prophecy of the coming Messiah to be born of a woman, for this truth was known from the earliest times, as we can read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Quote, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unquote. Well, you know what's quite interesting to me, of course, is when we see the quotations I give you from the Bible concerning these pagan religions, we have to understand that because of the Bible is true, all these families have the same root. In that time, they all came of Adam. You know, they had the same descendants, so there was always a little history told in the family before, even when the, late, when the people then later went anywhere else and became apostate, they still knew something that was written in the Bible at that time. They knew about the creation that was there. And that's, of course, what they use today to turn it all around. Now, Semiramis claimed her son was supernaturally conceived, and that he was the promised seed, the Savior. 
In the religion that developed, however, not only was the child worshipped, but the mother was worshipped also. Where have we heard that before? Mother worship? <laughs> Much of the Babylonian worship was carried on through mystery, mysterious symbols. It was a quote-unquote mystery religion. Since the deified Nimrod was believed to be the sun god, fire was considered his earthly representation. Thus, as we shall see, candles and ritual fires were lightened in his honor. In other forms he was symbolized by sun images, fish, trees, pillars and animals. Centuries later, Paul gave a description which perfectly fits the course that the people of Babylon followed. Quote, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. They changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. And we can read this, of course, in Romans chapter 1, verses 20 through, 21 through 26. I'm going to read this little part for you from the Bible now. Quote, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, and to birds, and to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness, through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever? Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Unquote. Now when we read this whole Bible passage, Romans chapter 1, I want to put it very close to your heart to read and study that in the Bible. Why is Romans 1 so important? Well, think about it. Romans is the first book that is written where the apostles left the jurisdiction of Judah in the time to went out to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul went to the heart of the pagan religion at that time. He went to Rome. And what he first wrote in Rome, and you can see that already here, makes so much sense when you look into the world today. For example, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. As we read in verse 24. Doesn't that remind you of the lesbian, gay, transsexual, intersexual, I don't know, agenda that we have today? The sodomites that come up today? where in the United States of America a few months ago, at the end of June 2015, sodomite marriages are legalized all over the country. What is that anything else than to dishonor their own bodies between themselves? What is that other than to the uncleanness uh, through the lusts of their own hearts? Think about it. It's all been written. Romans 1 is very, very powerful to understand in these times and to understand the sodomite, or as many call it, homosexual agenda. I call it sodomite, like the Bible does also. In the Bible you cannot find the word homosexual, but you will find the word sodomite. Okay, continue reading. 
This system of idolatry spread from Babylon to the nations, for it was from this location that men were scattered over the face of the earth, as we can read in Genesis 11, verse 9. Quote, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Unquote. And also interesting in this regard is to understand the name Babel. Bab El. B A B E L. Bab El. Bab means door or port, and El stands for God. Bab El, Babylon, Babel, was the port to God. They even built a tower so high because they said, He will not get us with another, with another flood because we will build a tower that reaches up to heaven. And you know what God thought about it and did later. <laughs> but the resemblance of Babel, Bab El, meaning the port to God, is very important. As they went from Babylon, they took their worship of the mother and child and the various mystery symbols with them. Herodotus, the world traveler and historian of antiquity, witnessed the mystery religion and its rites in numerous countries and mentions how Babylon was the primeval source from which all systems of idolatry flowed. Bunsen says that the religious system of Egypt was derived from Asia and, quote-unquote, the primitive empire in Babel. In his noted work, Nineveh and its remains, Layard declares that we have the united testimony of sacred and profane history that idolatry originated in the area of Babylonia, the most ancient of religious systems. All of these historians were quoted by Hislop. You know, Alexander Hislop, uh, a very fine author of, um, well, the title of his books, I just cannot get to it at the moment, but not important. Look it up on the internet. I have his books as PDF, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about the titles for the moment. I don't know if it was Code Word Babylon. I don't want to tell that this because I'm not sure right now. <clears throat> anyway, Alexander Hislop, look it up. He wrote very interesting books. When Rome became a world empire, it is a known fact that she assimilated into her system the gods and religions from the various sun-worshipping countries over which she ruled. Since Babylon was the source of sun worship, S U N, I remind you, sun worship, of these countries, we can see how the early religion of S U N, sun worship, Rome, was but the Babylonish worship that had developed into various forms and under different names in the countries to which it had gone. Bearing this in mind, we notice that it was during the time while Rome was ruling the world. <coughs> that the true Saviour, Jesus Christ, was born, lived among men, died and rose again. He ascended into heaven, sent back the Holy Spirit, and the New Testament Church was established in the earth. What glorious days! One only has to read the book of Acts to see how much God blessed his people in those days. Multitudes were added to the church. Great signs and wonders were performed as God confirmed his word with signs following. Christianity, appointed by the Holy Spirit, swept the world like a prairie fire. It encircled the mountains and crossed the oceans. It made kings to tremble and tyrants to fear. It was said of those early Christians that they had turned, quote, the, uh, turned the world upside down, unquote. So powerful their message uh, was their message and spirit. Yeah, and for confirmation, we read now in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, quote, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, unquote. Before too many years had passed, however, men began to set themselves up as lords over God's people in place of the Holy Spirit. Instead of conquering by spiritual means and by truth, as the early days, men began to substitute their ideas and their methods. 
Attempts to merge SUN, sun worship, in Christianity were being made <coughs> even in the days when our New Testament was being written, for Paul mentioned that the mystery of iniquity was already at work. He warned that there would come a falling away, <coughs> sorry, and some would, quote, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, unquote the counterfeit doctrines of S.U.N. sun worshippers. And for confirmation we go to Second Thessalonians 2, verses 3 through 7. Quote, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was that yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, uh, only he who, who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, unquote. This is, of course, a very, very important part of the Bible, because it was he who letteth, he letteth, what does that mean? He, be, he withholds something to rise up. And here we are talking about the little horn of Daniel. When the Roman Empire fell in 476 into ten kingdoms, those are the ten toes of the statue of Daniel's prophecy. And within the ten horns, as we uh, can see it also, the ten horns of the beast of Revelation, there came out a little horn with eyes and mouth like a man. And everybody of the early Christians knew that he who withholdeth was the Roman Caesar. But I think we go into this a little bit later in the reading here on too. But that's why Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is a very profound chapter to read in the Bible. And also we have here a little quote from Timothy, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4 verse 2. Quote, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron." Unquote. By the time that Jude wrote the book that bears his name, it was necessary for him to exhort the people to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For certain men had crept in who were attempting to substitute things that were not part of the original faith. Of confirmation we read Jude chapter 1 verse 3 and 4. Quote, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Unquote. And a little note from me, of course. There are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. I think he just described the society of Jesus for us. And if you're not aware of the society of Jesus, then do a little study on the Jesuits, as they also are called today. Those are certain men crept in unawares, unaware of the people who didn't know that. Infiltrate, that is what the Jesuits do. That's how they have their success. And we are already warned by Jude in the New Testament of them. When? Of course, we understand the Bible. I continue reading. 
Christianity came face to face with Babylonia S.U.N. sun worship in its various forms that had been established in the Roman Empire. The early Christians refused to have anything to do with its customs and beliefs. Much persecution resulted. Many Christians were falsely accused, thrown to the lions, burned at the stake and in other ways tortured and martyred. Then great changes began to be made. The Emperor of Rome professed conversion to Christianity. Imperial orders went forth throughout the empire that persecution should cease. Bishops were given high honors. The church began to receive worldly recognition and power. But for all of this, a great price had to be paid. Many compromises were made with S.U.N. Sun worship. Compromises. Where does God ever allow a compromise to his true word? He doesn't. Huh? He didn't in the Old Testament, and Israel is a witness of that, and he doesn't in the New Testament. Many compromises were made with sun worship. Compromises because the pagan Roman Empire all of a sudden got, quote-unquote, baptized with Christianity. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became a part of this world system. What does Jesus have to say about that? I believe Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my people would fight. But my kingdom is not from hence. I think that's in John. Instead of the church being separate from the world, it became part of this world, the author says here. The emperor showing favor demanded the place of leadership in the church. For in a S.U.N. sun worship, emperors were believed to be gods. From here on, wholesale mixtures of S.U.N. sun worship into Christianity were made, especially at Rome. History proves it was this mixture that produced the system which is known today as the Roman Catholic Church. Let's not doubt that there are many fine, sincere and devout Catholics. It is not our intention to treat lightly or to ridicule anyone whose beliefs we may here disagree with. But instead, that is historical truth will inspire all people of their religious affiliation to forsake Babylonian doctrines and seek a return to the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Signs and symbols rule the sun worship world, not words nor laws. So, with this I stop reading the first chapter, because I come to the end of it. <laughs> Already, uh, almost as fast as I thought it would be. And um, if you like me to continue doing this, I will do a video of this and upload it, and then I want your comments beneath it. And when you say, we want to hear more, we want to study this book too, and uh, we want to hear you reading it and explaining it, then please come and so, and I will do so. And if you don't, well, then I will just read it for myself, I guess. <laughs> But otherwise, of course, I will with much pleasure uh, do it openly and put it in videos and bring it out there that more people can learn about this S.U.N. sun worship. And um, sorry, I, I really have to say that every time that it is printed here, sun worship, because otherwise maybe people think it is S.O.N. from the sun. No, it is from the sun, S.U.N. And that's why I decided to pronounce it S.U.N. sun worship, that there will be no mistake made by anyone in understanding what I read here. Okay, looking forward to your comments. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and until the next time. Surely there will be next time of Juggler 66 anyway. <laughs> until next time, take care. God bless you, and bye-bye.